So we're continuing our series of grind, persevering through this tough world. How many people had to persevere this week? A little bit of all of us, huh? So, so what we're saying is even as Christians, we have to persevere through life. That life isn't always easy. You know, sometimes we got some ups and we got some downs in it. And, and as I was getting ready for this message and I was looking at the worship songs for this week, the, the song Christ is Enough. It, it's such a beautiful song. You know, Christ is enough for me. You know, the cross is before me. The world is behind me. But I got a question. Is Christ enough? Now, I figured everyone in here would quickly, yes. Yeah, pastor, Christ is enough. Because that's generally the answer you'll get when you ask a Christian, hey, is Christ enough? Well, yes, he is. Well, do we act and do we live our life truly like Christ is enough? Do we actually go through life every day saying that, yes, Christ is enough for me? And not only saying it, but believing it. You know, last week I talked about that white flag of surrender, and there's times we got that white flag way up here. Oh, I surrender. But then life happens. And that flag kind of comes to, yeah, I still surrender. Or sometimes it's, yeah, I still surrender. And sometimes we just put it in our pocket, you know, because all of a sudden life just gets too hard. And we put it in our pockets. And as I was looking at this message this week, I had to ask myself this question. As I'm looking at, is Christ enough and persevering through this faith? I ask myself this question. I'll only be happy when? And then I left that blank. And then I got to thinking, what fills that blank? I'll only be happy when? And I got to thinking about through my life of different times, I'll only be happy when, happy when? And, you know, I thought back to my days when I was, you know, in high school, I'll only be happy when I get my own car. Man, that's all I focused on. I want my own car. You know, I want that car. And I ended up getting myself a Mustang while I was in high school. And I just, I loved it. And I paid for it myself. And, and I thought it would make me happy. But it didn't make me happy. Well, then as I continued through my life, all the different things I put there, I'll be happy when I get more money. I'll be happy when I get a better job. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I have kids. Man, I'll be happy when my kids get a little older. Man, I'll be happy when my kids leave the house. <laughs> you know, but them are the things we go through. But now you think about it, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. How many times have I broken the first commandment? The first commandment of God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But I'll only be happy when. So I've taken these things in my life that have become idols, that have become gods in my life throughout my years. And then I think, man, I've broken that first commandment a lot. According to the Old Testament, I would have had to sacrifice a whole lot of sheep and goats. I would have sacrificed, walked away, and said, I'll only be happy when I don't have to do this again. Oh, here I go, and I would have had to walk back and do it again. But how many times in our lives do we actually do this? Do, do we go through and get these idols in our life? And we get caught up in it. And, and then I got to thinking, well, if I do that, I know none of y'all would do that. There's no way. But, but I honestly believe that in order to uncover idols that may be in our own hearts or inside your hearts, you need to ask yourself the same question. I'll only be happy when. What are some things in your life that fills that blank? That maybe is filling that blank right now. I'll only be happy when. And understand that whatever fills that blank is taking the place of Christ in your life. So if you will only be happy when you get this or this, is Christ enough? Is Christ truly enough in your life? If I'll only be happy when. I'll only be happy when. So, so as we continue to go on with this, and, and unfortunately even in today's society, you know, we, we all try and keep up with the Joneses. 
man, I can't believe they got a new car. I need to go get a new car. What do you mean they're getting a new house? Man, I got to go get a new house. What? They got a new hunting rifle? Man, I need to go get me a new hunting rifle. You know, we, we get caught up with keeping up with things. And we do this comparison thing. We compare ourselves to others. And, and as we're comparing ourselves to others, the worst thing that we do today, because it's right in our faces, we go to social media. And we'll open up Facebook. Or we'll open up Instagram. And you're scrolling through all these people. Man, I can't believe they're on vacation again. That's their fourth vacation this year. I can't believe John is up in New Hampshire again looking at all them leaves. Yeah, John, I got to pick on you because I was admiring. I was, I was, I'll only be happy if I could be with John this last week. He was up in New Hampshire and Vermont, and you're seeing all the leaves changing, and you get that comparison as you're scrolling through that Facebook feed. And then that comparison becomes you're not content with your own life. So that discontentment starts to turn into, man, I just, I'll only be happy when... And we put these idols in front of God. We, we, we put these things in front of Christ in our life. And sometimes we may just need to say, you know what? I, I need to get off Facebook. Well, I just need to unfriend John. So that way I don't see when he goes to New Hampshire. <laughs> you know, or maybe I just need to unfriend some people. Or I just need to turn it off. But we tend to compare ourselves to others. And... When we start comparing ourselves, we start thinking that we're less than what we are. But remember, when you post something on social media, what do you do? You make sure it's the best picture you have of the day. It's not the picture when you first woke up. It's not the picture when you've argued and tried to fight with the kids to get them into the vehicle. That's not the picture you put on social media. Okay, everyone stand outside the van and smile. And then everyone, oh my God, they're going to, look how well behaved their kids are. Meanwhile, you had to threaten to beat them to get them to stand there and smile. And we've all been there. But we will do a comparison in our life to other people. And then it drives us to, I'll only be happy when. I'll only be happy when I get this life that someone else has. I'll only be happy with this or this. And we get so tempted to compare ourselves to others. And I think the one thing we need to honestly keep a focus on, if we keep our focus on Jesus and his purposes, we can be content in all circumstances. If we keep our focus on Jesus and his purposes, we can be content in all circumstances. That's how we can be content in life. Our focus needs to remain on Jesus. So if our focus is on Jesus, guess what? Jesus is enough, correct? Correct. But we get caught up with, is he really enough? You know, today's scripture, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And the one good thing we know is when we look at different situations, how many times we can find it <clears throat> inside God's word. And we can see what someone in God's word did with these same things. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. But I want to give you some background prior to this, <clears throat> prior to these verses. <clears throat> okay, prior to these verses, no, I'm good, don't worry about it. The, the Apostle Paul is kind of going through his own life. He, he's going through and he's, and he's talking to give the confidence that he has in himself. Because a lot of times we'll get confidence in ourselves, you know, and the things that we've done. And as we're looking at other people and, you know, oh, well, it's okay, man. They, they got a 19, 1982 Buick Saber. Man, I got me this brand new Porsche 911. I'm better than them. Oh, well, you know, they're going on vacation in New Hampshire. Well, that's okay. I'm going to Ireland. You know, and we so we, then we go from this, you know, comparing our lives to actually looking at how we may be better than somebody else. Knowing, oh man, that's the best they can do. Oh, I got that beat. And that's basically what the Apostle Paul is doing in this scripture. Prior to the scripture we're going to read, the Apostle Paul is actually giving 
his, what he's capable of or his confidence that he has in himself. And he literally talks about, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. He says he's a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. So he's saying all of these things about him, about his heritage, who he is. And if anyone had the right to boast, it was the Apostle Paul. He even talks about how he was zealous in his persecution of the church and how he followed the law perfectly. So he's given all of this. And then we get to verse 7. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, after boasting about himself and everything that he is capable of and, and all of the stature that he should have, the Apostle Paul says this, But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. So after giving all of this background on who he is, on everything that he's done, he counts it all as loss. Counts it as dung. Some inter the New Living Translation actually refers to it, it is nothing but rubbish. Everything I had, everything I did, all of this is nothing but trash. Because I got to focus on Christ. Paul's in prison when he writes his letter. He writes his letter while he's in prison, and yet it's considered through all of his suffering, he's considered everything worthwhile because of Jesus. The entire book of Philippians written in, in, in prison talks about joy. Talks about joy. We will lose our joy looking at someone else, comparing ourselves to somebody else. And here the Apostle Paul is in prison writing about joy. It's one popular exposition actually stresses the importance of the joy in all circumstances throughout the book of Philippians and that Paul doesn't actually rebuke the church at all. He doesn't rebuke the church as he's writing his letter to them. He doesn't refer to any major problems inside the church. He's basically giving them nothing but joy. And in the 104 verses in the book of Philippians, he mentions, mentions Jesus 51 times. 51 times out of 104 verses, he mentions Jesus while in prison, showing joy, showing that his focus is Christ and that Christ is enough. Christ is enough for him in his life. And he considered everything else a loss. What would it look like if we considered everything else a loss and our focus just remained on him? You know, as I was looking at this, I come across, and I remember from years ago, and I, so I did some more research, but Pastor Yang Hu. Pastor Yang was a pastor of a church in China. And you know, in China, in order to have a Christian church, the government has to approve of it. And when they approve of it, they actually come and they, they have people at the services, they record the services, and they do everything. And if you say anything against the state, you're shut down. So you got to preach Christ crucified, but kind of stick with, I know the, what the government says, so I got to kind of figure out the two. Well, Pastor Yang opened up an underground church, and they were meeting in an apartment. They had, you know, a couple, you know, they started out with 30, 40, 50 people. Well, the church kept growing. So then they had to get a bigger apartment. Then it kept growing. They had to get a bigger apartment. Finally, they had 3,000 people come to this church. 
So they had 3,000 people coming to the church, and, and it just kept growing, and the name of the church was actually Livingstone Church. So as this church grew, now all of a sudden the government started to find out about it. And they raided the church on Christmas Day. So on Christmas Day, they went in, they raided the church, and they went after the pastor, and they wanted a pastor's jump drive that had a sermon on it. And what they did is they took him, they arrested him, and said he was providing state secrets. And he was going against the government. He ended up in prison, was in prison for two and a half years. Was in prison for two and a half years for doing nothing but spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church continued to meet while he was gone, and the government actually put notices up there saying it was an illegal church and no one should go to it. To this day, the church is still a thriving church in China. And to this day, they have the, the police or the military state in there each week videotaping the services because it continued to grow. Now, what I tell you that to let you know that <clears throat> while he was in prison, he ended up getting scabies. He ended up with a um, condition and as he was going in, while he was in prison, he wrote letters to his wife. And there's actually a blog post out there that has all the different letters. And just a piece of the letter while he was in prison, you can see the joy he had is like the Apostle Paul. And this is some of the stuff that he wrote to his wife. Our wonderful God, our Lord forever, forever he said, who can guess his wisdom and mystery? Our faith is built on his word. He never changes and never does wrong. This is the unchangeable maxim. We listen more to God and less to human beings. The pastor told his wife not to worry about his health, including the liver disease and the scabies that cropped up to him since he was in, in, the, uh, in jail. He says the fatty liver disease was diagnosed in prison. The suffering is bearable. The Lord has grace. The canker sore has not returned since May of this year. Thank God. And then he finished off this letter, actually lifting up his wife, saying this. Never be dejected and despondent. Always look up at our Lord and always keep the spiritual life above the chaos of the real environment. Rest in God's arms. Some rely on chariots, some on horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Be upright and take care. Be prepared for the rest of the road. I will go with you. If the Lord doesn't allow it, not a single hair from your head will drop on the floor. He's in prison. He's suffering. And then are the letters he writes to his wife. We're not in prison. We're going through this life each and every day, and we get a little bit of suffering. And we want to ask, is Christ enough? Is Christ really enough for me? You know, God, I'll only be happy when. And that's what we do. Because we get so selfish in our life that, that as soon as we got to persevere through something, all of a sudden we cop this attitude. There's no joy involved in it. The Apostle Paul was in prison. Pastor Yang in prison, has scabies, has a liver, kidney disease, and he's still telling his wife, don't worry. God is faithful. Look to God in all things. Have joy during the suffering. Persevere through hard times. Persevere through this hard life. Both Paul and Pastor Yang had a bigger perspective of God than their circumstances. Do we have a bigger perspective of God than our circumstances? Or sometimes are our circumstances bigger than our God? When in reality, we know our God is bigger, but we will let our circumstances grow bigger. And instead of persevering, we will whine. And we will not be joyful. We will not have fun. We will make sure everyone around us is miserable because we're miserable. And that's not what we're called to do. Through all of our suffering, through all of our persevering, there should be joy. There should be joy in everything we do because Christ is enough. But we get caught up asking that question. Go ahead, say it with me. I'll only be happy when. 
and we fill in the blank. And some of you this morning may have filled in the blank while you're coming to church. And in some circumstances, you might say, I don't understand. I can't see joy in this. Open up his word. Open up his word and look through his word and you're going to see there's joy all throughout it. As much as we may go through, there is some place in the Bible where people are going through something that we're going through or something worse and you see joy in their life. We can choose joy in everything that we do. Romans 8, 28 tells us this. We know that all things work together for God, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. There's a promise in that. It's that promise of reinsurance that, that in all things, in all things, God's working to, together for the good. And it means that no matter what your circumstances are, there, there's only two qualifiers for God to be working all things for your good. Only two qualifiers. First, he works for the good of those who loved him. He's going to work for you for those who love him. And, and if you love God and if you trust him, he, he's working for your good. Now, like I've always said, it's not going to be, you know, ponies and puppies and unicorns. There's suffering that's going to go with it but he's going to be looking out for your good. And remember, there's times you got to go through the struggle to get stronger. We go through the shadow of the valley of the death. We go through, we don't stay there. And a lot of us, when something happens, we will park ourselves right there and decide, I can't move. We get paralyzed by what's going on around us. And instead of standing up and instead of moving forward and doing what God's called us to do, knowing that he can work out good in all situations, we sit there and we sulk. We need to be able to stand up, choose joy, and continue to go forward and know that Christ is enough. Because when you're not doing that, you're asking that, you're basically, well, Christ, is he really enough? Well, yes, he is enough, but we got to do our part. He will work out the good for those who love him, so we've got to start by loving him. And second, he's going to work out for those who are called according to his purpose. Are you doing what God called you to do? Are you living the life? Are you walking the walk and talking the talk and everything that God told you to do? Or are you sitting on the sideline patiently waiting, saying, I'm waiting on the Lord, sitting on your couch? You can't wait on the Lord and be sitting. You got to be moving. It requires action to go forward. If you sit there, you're going to like grow roots and you're going to be stuck. You got to continue to move. And trying to do the same old thing the same old way and expect the different results is nothing but insanity. We sit there and we try, well, this is what we've always done. Well, where has it always gotten you? And a lot of times we'll sit there, well, uh, um, this is what we've always done, so this is what we're going to do. And then you're like, we're well, looking around saying, well, wait, how come the church is dying? How come there's nobody here? How come the same thing is happening that happened to me 10 years ago because you haven't changed? You're not doing the will and the purpose that God has called you to do. And he will work everything out for you good if you continue to move forward. Do what he called you and walk that purpose in his life. Don't sit back and say, I'll only be happy when. You should be saying, I'll only be happy when Jesus shows up in my life and changes me and radically changed me from who I was to who I am today. And I'm walking the purpose that he has for me. And then as you're out there and you're doing what he's called you to do, you're going to see the change in your own life. You're going to see the change in other people's lives. And you're going to be able to say, Christ is enough for me. That's when you're going to be able to say it. But too many times we get caught up in the past. Or we get caught up with this and that and we don't want to do what God called us to do. Don't get caught sitting in the past. Don't get caught saying, if only, I'd only be happy if. Because you're not going to be happy if. It's not going to bring you the joy. It's not going to bring you that contentment that you had. And when you're persevering, going through something, it's not going to get you to where you want to go. You're going to be stuck doing the same old thing, expecting a different results, and that is the definition of insanity. How many people in here are insane because you've been trying to do the same old thing for too long? And you're getting the same exact results. And God's calling you to do something different. He's calling you to have a purpose inside your life. And you're not doing it. 
And then you wonder why nothing's turning out. Man, I don't know why it's not turned out. I don't know why it's not working out for me. Because you're not doing what God called you to do. You're trying to live off yourself. You're trying to be, you know, live off of someone else, keeping up with the Joneses, scrolling through Facebook, saying, man, I wish I had this or that. I wish I had Scott's boat. At least he'd be in the water more often than in the driveway. Just saying. No picking, Scott, but boy, it'd be in the water a whole lot more. Uh, always here. And, and like I said, I, I can't follow John on Facebook, so I'm unfriending him today because then I don't want to go to New Hampshire and watch the leaves change. You know, I spent all that time in North Carolina. I got to see seasons. I was born and raised down here. All of a sudden, I go to North Carolina. I'm like, what are these pretty colors? Because we don't have them down here. But we try and live through someone else's life, and we need to live the life that God called us to live. We need to live that life. Be the best you. Be the best you that God called you to be. That's what we're called to do in life. That's what we're called. And if we do that, he will work everything out for our good. You, you see, in this day, we're so used to surrounding ourselves with things. And, and so many times, you know, it's, we, we've got these needs in our life. And God will always provide for our needs. But the problem is that we get stuck on our wants. Well, I really don't need this, but I want it. So, you know, need came right before, so I need this want, so that means I need it. And we get so caught up trying to, trying to do all these things and getting our wants and, and, and trying to make ourselves happy with all these outside sources, with all these other things. And the only thing that can truly make us happy is Jesus in our hearts, doing what he called us to do. But we get caught up, especially in today's environment, Man, I can go on Amazon and have it delivered this afternoon. That's pretty good stuff right there. I don't even have to go inside a store. I want it. I can have it today or tomorrow. Guaranteed. And sometimes we just expect everything to be like that. We want it, and all of a sudden our want becomes a need instead of our need being a need. Our wants start to outweigh us. And then when our wants, hey, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want this, that's when you start comparing yourselves to others. And you start walking away from what Christ called you to do. And you're not living your life for the purpose that he called you to live. We need to keep our focus on him. You know, there's always things going on in this world. There's always going to be. There's always going to be the next big thing. What's the next big thing? What am I going to do next? And I think as believers, we need to remind ourselves again that ultimately underneath everything, that we need to separate ourselves from the stuff and from the things in our lives and focus our lives on Jesus. We need to remain focused on him. And as I said at the beginning, if we keep our focus on Jesus and his purposes, we can be content in all circumstances. But it's where we keep our focus. And I honestly believe that we as Christ followers, if we do that, if we keep our focus on Jesus and on his purposes, we can be content in all circumstances. And then you know what you can actually say? That Christ is enough. Because when we focus that way, Christ will be enough in our life. And then when I ask that question, is Christ enough? You can truly say, yes, he is. Without having to say, hey, but, you know, I'm still feeling in that empty spot of I'll only be happy when. Christ can be enough if we focus on him. If we remain focused on him and everything we do in our life, we can then be content. Instead of trying to be content in stuff and everything else. And, you know, maybe you're just sitting here saying, you know, pastor, I just don't understand. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to live that life. I'm trying to do what he's called me to do. And I'm trying to live that life and I'm trying to focus on him, but all this other stuff gets in the way. Well, that's when you need to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and you need to lean in and be able to lean on each other and be able to come up and say, man, I'm struggling this week. Hey, Chris, man, I'm struggling this week, brother. I, I need you to help me out. 
Can I, can I lean on you? Can you pray for me, brother? Can, can, can you be there? Can I pick up the phone and call you as I'm going through this stuff in my life? We need to be able to lean on each other instead of going, man, I like that cross Chris has on. I need to get me one, but I need a bigger one than that. I love Jesus more than him. My cross needs to be bigger than his because I'll only be happy if Christ is enough. I will only be happy when Christ is enough in my life that I am content with nothing but him. That's what we got to focus on. That's what we got to be. But be there for each other. Lift each other up. Instead of trying to keep up with the Joneses, go over and talk to the Joneses. So that as you're keeping up with them, they can keep up with you, Jesus. Because maybe they don't know Jesus. So you want to keep up with the Joneses, introduce them to Jesus. And maybe you're here and you're like, Pastor, well, I don't know Jesus. Or, you know, I've kind of, I know Jesus, and, but I haven't been living that life. I've been stuck with the I'll only be happy if. I'll only be happy if. if and, and, and I know when I was 13 years old, I accepted Jesus but I haven't lived that life. I haven't been doing what he's called me to do. Well, during this final song today, you can come up here and we can talk about it and recommit your life to Jesus. Recommit your life to saying, Christ is enough for me. <clears throat> and maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and, and you need to take that next step of Jesus, I need you in my life. And you need to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And, and understand if you're waiting to get it right, you're never going to be right. It's never going to be the perfect time to accept Jesus Christ in your life and what you think. Because we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. I fall short every day. I've broken that first commandment a lot in my life. Probably broke it yesterday. I'll only be happy if we put idols in front of God. So if you're waiting to get it right before you accept Jesus, you're never going to get it right. So you might as well make that move today because <clears throat> the perfect time to accept Jesus is right now. At that very moment is the very time to, the perfect time to do it. It's not about waiting to accept Jesus. It's when you feel that call on your life and you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you that, hey, I need Jesus. Do it right then. For God's word said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that easy. Now living the life is going to be a little harder. Because following Jesus every day and saying Christ is enough for me is a little harder than confessing him as your Lord. Because the world's not going to change, but you will. And that's where persevering comes in. Where we can seek joy in every situation as we continue to move forward. And then maybe some of you just got to say, man, I have been uncontent with my life. Jesus has not been enough for me. And you just need to come up to the altar of Jesus and give it back to him. <clears throat> give it back to him and ask him to take that, whatever that want, whatever that contentment is, keeping up with the Joneses, whatever it may be in your life that's got you just so jacked up that you can't say Christ is enough, and leave it here at the altar. Give it back to him today so that you can truly say Christ is enough and that you can be content in following Jesus where he calls you to go because he will work everything out, everything out for you, for those who love him, for those who are following his purpose. Are you following his purpose and you, do you really love him or are you just putting on an act on Sunday mornings? Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. Lord, I don't know what it is or who it is, but Lord, I ask you to make that move. Lord, I ask you to make that move that we will get rid of this discontentment and that we will be content in you. That we will seek you with our whole hearts, Lord. 
Lord, that we will walk this plan and walk this purpose that you have for us. That we will bring others to know you, that we will plant seeds, that we will be them laborers in the harvest, that we will go out there and seek others for you. And most importantly, that we will seek you first in everything that we do. That we know our happiness and our joy only comes by focusing on you because everything else doesn't matter, Lord. All this stuff we may have here doesn't matter because it'll be gone the day we meet you face to face. And we enter into your kingdom. So Lord, I ask you to make that move. Make that move that, they will perp- that people will purposely follow you and be content in what you have for them. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.